Professor Richard Mibei, Vice Chancellor Moi University, Professor Bob Wishitemi, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Justice Wamukoya, Dean School of Information Sciences, members of the University Council, members of the University Management Board, deans of schools, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to take this opportunity to express my sincere and deep felt thanks and those of my wife Fleur and my daughters Amolo and Bettina to Moi University and in particular to the School of Information Sciences of the Department of Publishing and Media Studies for deciding to set up a center for East Africa media research in my name. It is indeed a great honor to me and my family that an institution of such high academic standing as Moi University has chosen to recognize my journalistic and publishing endeavors through such a center, as well as to establish an annual lecture in my name that is intended to explore media themes that would enrich knowledge and contribute to research and innovation. I wish I was here in person to express these deep felt sentiments, but due to health reasons, I cannot. That's why I'm addressing you on video. I am, however, with you in spirit. What gives me even greater pleasure about being associated with a new center that the School of Information Sciences is setting up in my name is the center's emphasis on research. Research is the basis of good journalism. Without research, media output is shallow. And here I'm not talking just about research into components of a news story, a feature article, or broadcast program. I also have in mind research that helps the media to understand itself, its history, its operational philosophy, its strengths or weaknesses, and its impact on society. In my talk today, I would like to look at a number of issues of possible research that might be highlighted by the history of the Weekly Review, a magazine that I edited and published from 1975 to 1999. I choose the Weekly Review because I know about it more than I know about any other media publication, and also because I believe it has had some impact on the Kenyan media scene. Before starting the weekly review, I had worked for Nation Newspapers Limited, as it was then called. I started as a trainee reporter in 1962 and worked for about a year before leaving to go work as a public relations officer with a private company. In 1964, Nation Newspapers Limited offered me the job of editor-in-chief of their publications. I was then only 25 years old, and I was going to be in charge of senior people, mostly British, who had been training me in journalism. It is a fascinating story in itself, but this is not a place to tell it. Let me just say I took the job thereby becoming the first African newspaper editor-in-chief in the country. I left the nation after only 18 months as editor-in-chief because I did not feel that I was being utilized properly. I became a freelance journalist, writing columns for the nation and news features for the British newspaper, The Guardian. One of the columns I wrote for the nation was called With a Light Touch which was my attempt to look at serious issues, mostly politics, from a humorous point of view. The column was illustrated with cartoons by Terry Hurst, an extremely talented artist who was then teaching fine art at Kenyatta University. And one of the characters that Terry illustrated in the light touch column was called Joe. In 1973, Terry and I started a humor magazine that we called Joe. Our aim was to look at the humorous side of politics and Kenyan life in general. And I must say, the magazine was a great success. It introduced Kenyans to a kind of humor that had not been featured in the country's media publications before. And thanks to Terry, 
the magazine also laid the foundations for newspaper cartooning in Kenya. Working for Joe magazine was great fun, but this was also a time when newspapers were struggling to cope with complex political stories. After the 1974 general election, new and younger MPs were beginning to make an impression on the country's politics. They included the likes of Josiah Mwangi or J.M. Kariuki, Martin Shikuku, Mark Mwithaga, Jean-Marie Serone, Koegi Waomwere, Chelegat Mutai, and George Anyona. These young leaders were making contributions to the country's politics, which the two main daily newspapers, The Nation and The Standard, were not, in my view, doing justice to. I thought that the Kenyan public needed a more comprehensive and analytical approach to news. At Joe magazine, we could not meet that challenge. We were merely a human magazine. So, at the end of 1974, I left Joe magazine to Terry, and in February 1975 started a weekly magazine that I called the Weekly Review. Soon thereafter, my wife Fleur and I would start another weekly, a children's magazine that we called Rainbow, which Fleur edited. It was a magazine which over the years would make a considerable contribution to the education of Kenyan children, especially in natural history and current events. The name the weekly review was purely descriptive. I wanted to review and present weekly events in a more meaningful and analytical manner than the daily newspapers were doing at the time. In a sense, I was trying to do what Time and Newsweek magazines were then doing, picking up major news stories of the week and trying to present them comprehensively with sufficient background information and analysis to make them more meaningful to the reader. It was a big challenge. We had ideas but no resources to do a good job. We didn't have money. We did not have the personnel. We started the magazine with a staff of only four. Besides myself as editor, there was Horace Awori as assistant editor, Sarah Elderkin as editorial assistant, and Frederick Mogo as advertising manager. We printed and distributed the magazine with Nation Newspapers Limited. The nation also provided us with virtually all the photographs we used in the magazine. They paid themselves for printing and distribution from the proceeds of the sales of our magazine. When we started, the price of a copy of the weekly review was 3 shillings and 50 cents. That cover price wasn't enough to pay for the printing and distribution of the magazine, a point we did not realize when we started the magazine. We did not have the resources to promote the magazine through a formal launch or advertising. At the end of the week, after we put out our first issue, we had many copies returned and sold. Indeed, by the third issue, we thought we were going to go out of business. Then, on the morning of March 1st, 1975, a bomb exploded at the bus station of the East African Road Services Company located at Racecourse Road in Nairobi. 27 people were killed, more than 100 were injured. But even as the public were trying to come to terms with the bomb incident, rumors started going around that J.M. Karyoki, the member of parliament for Nyandarwa North, was missing. Might he have been among the 27 people killed at the bus station? No, he wasn't. James Kariuki's body was later found at the Nairobi city mortuary, and he had not died from injuries caused by a bomb explosion. He had been shot several times at close range. News of James' murder was received with shock throughout the country. In Parliament, angry MPs called for an independent inquiry into his death. Parliament would later set up a committee, chaired by Bungoma East MP Elijah Mwangale, to investigate the murder. The weekly review did not have the resources to dig deeply into the circumstances that led to James' death, but we decided to report what was going on in Parliament 
with as much detail as possible. What most MPs were saying was critical of the government, and we felt that both the nation and the standard were reluctant to give much publicity to their sentiments. Unlike the daily newspapers, we had space because we didn't have much advertising and we had time, a whole week in which to do our stories, most of them based on parliamentary Hansard reports. The most important part of the James story that we published was a final report put out by Mwangale's committee. Our story included the version that the committee had first drawn up but which they were convinced by President Jomo Kenyatta not to table in Parliament because it named the President's brother-in-law, Biyu Koinange, as one of the suspects in JM's murder. The weekly review's coverage of the JM murder story was definitely one of the milestones in the history of the magazine. Because of it, we gained much credibility and respect with readers and many politicians. And the James story also set a precedent for delving into many other events with greater competence. Such was the case, for instance, when in 1977, the Weekly Review covered an attempt by a number of politicians belonging to the Gikuyu M1 Meru Association or GEMA to change the country's constitution so as to bar Vice President Daniel Arab Moy from automatically succeeding President Kenyatta. As in the case of the coverage of the JM murder story, the outstanding aspect of our coverage of the change the constitution attempt was the detailed account of the various positions that different politicians took on the matter. And we did so in a non-partisan manner. We were respected enough to be able in 1977 to get a bank loan with which we bought our own newspaper printing press. We felt confident enough about our place in the media that we even launched a new weekly newspaper, the Nairobi Times. Vice President Moy officiated at the launch ceremony that took place at the Intercontinental Hotel in Nairobi. There was no doubt that within a short time of publishing, we had made a great impression on the Kenyan media scene. For instance, after President Kenyatta died in August 1978 and Vice President Moi took over as president, we were the only publication that was given advanced knowledge of who was going to succeed Moi as vice president. Less than a fortnight after Moi took over, Attorney General Charles Njonjo called me to his office at Sharia House, saying he had a major story that he could not trust a mere reporter with. I thought he had summoned other editors, but when I arrived at his office, there was only one other person, President Moy. John Joe asked me who I thought was going to be appointed vice president. I said I didn't know. He then said that if he were the editor of the Weekly Review, he would tell his readers that Moy Kibaki, then Minister for Finance, was going to be appointed vice president. That's how come the next issue of the Weekly Review had Kibaki on its cover with a headline, The Rising Star. Without revealing our source, our lead story predicted that Kibaki would be the next vice president. After Moi appointed Kibaki as his vice president, some politicians who had an eye on the job were not very happy. They thought we had campaigned for Kibaki and had become a mouthpiece of the new president. That we weren't that close to President Moy's government became clear when in 1979, the Weekly Review decided to carry out an opinion poll among its readers, asking them to predict who in each of the country's parliamentary constituencies would win in the general election that was going to take place in November that year. It was the first opinion poll to be carried in the Kenyan press in respect of a general election. We intended to publish the opinion poll's results before the general election, but the week before the issue carrying the results of the poll was to come out, I got a call from Jeffrey Carithi, 
then head of the public service. He said we must carry our opinion poll results because they would influence the outcome of the general election. What Karithi was saying didn't make sense to me. We were only a weekly publication with a circulation of no more than about 20,000. We could not influence the decisions of millions of Kenyan voters. But Karithi was adamant. He said he was merely conveying orders from the president. We did not publish our readers' predictions before the elections. I felt that if indeed we were that powerful, it would not be fair to influence the outcome of the general election. We published the results a week after the general election, and it turned out that our readers had a very good grasp of Kenyan politics. They were nearly 80% correct in their predictions. But even the publishing of our opinion poll results after the general election upset the government. Within days, it had pulled out all its advertising from the weekly review. Ironically, it will be the same government that would save the weekly review from collapse five years later. When we bought a printing press in 1977, we wanted to be free of nation newspapers as far as printing was concerned. Little did we know or the financial implications of going into newspaper printing. The press we bought was not a commercial press that could serve small customers. Only newspapers could use it, and each of the two main newspapers had its own printing press. Because of the small circulation of the weekly review, the Nairobi Times and Rainbow, which had become a monthly, our printing staff were idle most of the time. To keep the press and the staff busy, we decided to do something we should never have done. We turned the Nairobi Times into a daily newspaper. That was in early 1982. As a daily newspaper, the Nairobi Times was a professional newspaper. Our staff were so dedicated to their work that it was the only daily newspaper that came out the day after the abortive coup attempt of August 1, 1982. The other dailies seemed to have been too scared to let their journalists work on the day of the abortive coup. But our turning the Nairobi Times into a daily meant that we had to employ more staff and had to incur more printing expenses. By early 1983, we had more than 70 employees working for our publications and for the printing press. With little advertising coming our way, we soon were on the verge of collapse. To keep the Weekly Review and Rainbow alive, I approached the ruling party, Kanu, and suggested they take over our printing press and the Nairobi Times. Kanu leaders had of late been talking of the party needing a newspaper. After lengthy discussions, we reached an agreement that let Kanu take over the Nairobi Times, our printing press, and their staff in exchange for our keeping the Weekly Review and Rainbow. For a while, the printing of our two magazines was done by the new company that Kanu set up, Kenya Times Media Trust Limited. But they could not handle our printing on time, and we ended up going back to the nation for printing. On their part, Kanu did not continue the Nairobi Times. Instead, it started two daily newspapers of its own, the English language Kenya Times and the Swahili Kenya Leo. I should have learned a lesson from the painful experience, but within a few years of giving up our printing press and the Nairobi Times, I had launched new publications, ECHO, the Industrial Review, and the Financial Review. With another bank loan, we had even bought another newspaper press, bigger than the first one, on which to print the weekly review and some of our new publications. Again, the journalist in me was running ahead of business realities. By the time the weekly review collapsed in 1999, all these other publications, including our children's magazine Rainbow, had folded. But that time too, I had gone into other media ventures. 
had started STV, the first fully indigenously owned private TV station in Kenya. The government was good enough to give us frequencies to cover most of the country. And the Voice of Kenya even rented a space on their transmission complex at Limuru, from which we sent our TV signal to Mombasa, where we had opened a transmission station. My plan was to open TV stations in other urban centers where we would go into partnership with local investors. We thought of Kisumu and Nyeri as the next stations. In Nairobi, we even started building a large TV studio in the industrial area. But like most of my media dreams, STV was a good idea that did not take business realities into consideration. I did not appreciate the enormous resources that running a TV station entailed. Those were the old days of analog equipment, which was bulky and expensive. A newspaper reporter in those days needed nothing but a pen and a notebook to cover a story. But to cover the same story, a TV station had to send a TV crew, a reporter, a cameraman, and technical support, often in a van. And even more than the print media, broadcasting depends almost entirely on advertising for survival. During the first two years of his life, STV had very little advertising. With few resources, STV could not cover news. It confined itself to simple programs and imported entertainment material. Some of the imported programs were interesting. A good example was a soap opera, Days of Our Life, which I believe set the trend to soap operas in other TV stations. But on the whole, STV was not a viable business venture. And in due course, we had to let it go. However, unlike the Nairobi Times, Rainbow, The Weekly Review, and all our other publications, STV did not entirely disappear from the media scene. In 2004, I approached one of Uhuru Kenyatta's companies and had it take over the assets and liabilities, as well as the employees of Stellavision, the company through which we run STV. That's how come STV is still operating today as part of Media Max, the media house that runs People newspaper, and K24 TV station. Ladies and gentlemen, that very briefly is the history of the Weekly Review and its system media operations. As you can see, even the little I have talked about suggests broader research. You could, as I hope the news center will do, research into the general treatment of stories by the Weekly Review and how it differed from that of the daily newspapers and other publications of its time. We covered the same stories. Indeed, we depended to a very large extent on stories already covered by the daily newspapers. So, what exactly made us different? I would suggest that one of the distinguishing aspects of our content, as would be the case with many news magazines, was that we were more comprehensive and analytical in presentation. Being analytical meant that we had to provide sufficient background to our stories. This called for more detailed and greater accuracy in our presentation. It also meant presenting stories from a historical perspective that gave our readers an appreciation of the relationship between current affairs and past events. In many cases, we had to dig deeper into stories than daily newspapers were doing. A good example of our digging deeper into a story was Cameron, the drug that the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Kemri, came up with as a cure for HIV AIDS. The launch of Cameron in 1990 was challenging to media people in the sense that we were dealing with a highly complex scientific issue that required ability to convey the, to the general public information in clear and simple terms. Like other Kenyans, we were excited that it was Kenyan scientists, led by Kemri's director, Dr. David Koech, 
and Nairobi University Professor Arthur Obel, who had discovered a cure for AIDS. Like other Kenyan media, we gave publicity to the claim. The excitement, however, would turn to disappointment when it transpired that Koech and Obel had not in fact discovered the drug they called Cameron. It had been given to them by an American veterinary researcher to test on AIDS patients. When the drug cleared most of the symptoms that AIDS patients had, Koech and Obel decided to take credit for it. They announced that they had discovered an AIDS cure, even though the drug was only a temporary relief, not a cure. The Weekly Review was the only media publication that presented the story of Cameron in detail, and it was the only one that exposed the fraud behind Camry's claims. Not that we were always accurate. There were several occasions when incorrect reporting created problems for us. Such was the case when in April 1976, we carried a story claiming that the Kenya government was going to recognize Angola, which had just become independent from Portugal. Angola was then ruled by the Socialist Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, led by President Agostino Neto. At the time, the Kenya government was conservative and opposed to socialist ideas. Our story apparently upset President Kenyatta. At a cabinet meeting in Nakuru, he reported they wanted to know who had written the offensive story. As in the case of most of our stories, this particular one had no byline. When no minister could tell the president who had written the story, Kenyatta ordered that the editor of the Weekly Review, that's me, be flown by police helicopter to Nakuru to explain who had told us that the Kenya government was about to recognize the MPLA government. I learned later from Dr. Munyo Oyaki, the foreign affairs minister at the time, that several ministers pleaded with Kenyatta that I was just a young man who did not know what I was doing. They were afraid that I could end up in detention if I was flown to Nakuru. Wayaki promised the cabinet he would get the weekly review to correct the story, which we did. In addition to incorrect stories such as the Angola one, we published material that sometimes upset people. We were threatened with libel many times. But I'm glad to say that not once did we have to call upon our lawyer, John Haminoa, to go to court to defend us in a libel suit. All those who felt aggrieved or their lawyers appear to have come to the conclusion that they had little chance of success if they chose to go to court. The few things I have presented as milestones in the history of the Weekly Review have highlighted its journalistic performance. This is still remembered today. We started a news magazine with no money and it lasted for 24 years. We started a magazine for children, all children, not just upper class children, and it survived for 19 years. Still, in the end, all our ventures failed. We who ran the Weekly Review and worried about its content were just journalists, not businessmen. We failed to appreciate the complex business world in which we operated. We concentrated most of our energies on doing stories that would appeal to readers and forgot that most print media survives not just from circulation sales but also from advertising. And sometimes our editorial policies made it even more difficult for us to increase our advertising. The Weekly Review, for instance, once decided that it would not carry cigarette advertising anymore. The decision was based on my wife Flair's concern that the ads were encouraging a dangerous habit. All the cigarette ads we carried at the time, mostly on our covers, came from BAT the main cigarette manufacturer in the country. We soon discovered that not only did we by choice lose revenue from BAT, but we also started losing revenue 
from other advertisers. We learned later that the BAT advertising manager had told some of his business colleagues in other companies that we were so rich we did not need advertising. The Weekly Review, like other publications in the country, was a Kenyan publication. But I would say that we prided ourselves a lot more in writing our stories from a Kenyan, or shall I say, nationalistic point of view. What drove us most was dedication to the profession, not to class, business, or ethnic interests. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a very brief and rather superficial account of some of the challenges we faced and the experiences we had at the Weekly Review while it was alive. Challenges and experiences that would be of importance to any researcher interested in the history and role of the media in Kenya and generally in East Africa. A question that a researcher may like to answer is whether, given what we went through with the Weekly Review, a magazine of similar objectives would survive or be relevant in Kenya today. Five years after the Weekly Review died, we sold the title to Nation Media Group. My hope, and that of the nation's management at the time, was that the magazine would be revived soon. But ten years later, it has not been revived. This despite the fact that some of the top people of the nation, Joe Dindo, who was editorial director of Nation Media Group until recently, Macharia Gaisto and Jaindi Kisero had all worked for the Weekly Review. Kisero was in fact its last editor. It would appear that even with all its financial and human resources, Nation Media Group has not found it worth reviving the magazine. I must confess that I am not myself sure whether if I had the resources of Nation Media Group, I would want to revive the weekly review. The current media environment would make such a venture very difficult. First, we have a much more educated population, a population that has access to the internet and its enormous variety of information. And it's not just the internet. Our country has a lot more newspapers, magazines, TV and radio stations than during our time the media competition would present a major business challenge. But I might also add that the environment the Kenyan media works in today is not completely conducive to the kinds of journalistic ideals that we cherished during our days. Today, for instance, there is a new factor affecting journalism that did not exist in our time, corruption. Recently, I did a documentary on the history of banking in Kenya and had to interview the governor of the central bank. Before we settled down to the interview, he asked me what has gone wrong with the journalism since the days of the weekly review. I thought he was merely expressing the kind of fondness that old readers of the magazine often express when they meet me. But he was talking about corruption in the media today. He said that on several occasions he has received telephone calls from journalists and senior ones at that, telling him they have negative stories about the central bank. If he was willing to meet them, they could discuss how the stories could be killed. He has always told such journalists to go ahead and publish what they have. In our days we had many challenges to press freedom but corruption among journalists and editors was not one of them. But I must say corruption in Kenya was not as pervasive then as it is today. To understand the media and its history, one clearly needs to understand the environment in which the media operates. I think a good idea for media research would be the determination of the impact of the media on national interests we need to establish by looking at the past what aspects of a nation's development or history have been affected by the conduct of the media and how the media's impact is likely to shape our future. In the US, for instance, the media played a big role in changing the American people's attitude towards race discrimination. 
is there something that the Kenyan media can learn from the American experience as we struggle to fight negative ethnicity in our country? What, in a researcher's opinion, is the role of the Kenyan media in dealing with major challenges to our country, such as corruption, disease, famine, gender discrimination, crime, and terrorism? And how is the Kenyan media fulfilling that role? I am confident that given the high academic talent behind Moi University's School of Information Sciences, and the noble objectives that have been set for the new center that bears my name, researchers will address these and other challenges adequately. Finally, let me on my own behalf and on behalf of my family end this talk by again thanking Moi University and the School of Information Sciences for deciding to honor me by setting up a center for East African media research in my name. It is my sincere hope that in the not too distant future, this center will be the place which academics and media practitioners, both in Kenya and abroad, turn to in order to understand what impact the media has had and can have in our country and the African continent as a whole. Many thanks again for giving me this opportunity to address you on a subject that has been dear to me for more than half a century. As I said before, it is unfortunate that I'm not here in person to talk to you, but my spirit is with you and with the noble vision that Moi University and the School of Information Sciences have for the future of media research in our country. Thank you. <laughs>